And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Christophe Bell, who is going to speak to us on, um, on issues of uh, uh, innovation integration. His uh, talk is uh, complimentary to Dr. Pitet's. Uh, we were discussing before the event, uh, there must be some telepathic communications between uh, Swiss individuals because it just so turns out that his talk uh, begins uh, in the middle section of where uh, DDAs uh, started in uh, terms of the performance of the uh, of this Switzerland as a nation. So anyway, very complimentary and somehow they did it without speaking to each other, so I'm not certain how that happens. Uh, Christoph hails from Bern originally, where he still has family. And um, you'll note in his uh, bio that uh, he originally, um, he has a, a NMA, he studied at the University of Bern and the University of Illinois, and he studied uh, physics with an interest in uh, uh, particle physics, and we know that there was a very famous physicist who uh, wrote the theory of relativity uh, in a small apartment in Bern. So, any, if any of you ever visit there, it's fascinating to go through and see the small apartment where Albert Einstein actually wrote the theory of relativity overlooking the main street in Bern. So, uh, um, Christoph comes from from. Uh, um, a setting in, which is very interesting in, in Switzerland. He's uh, since 2009 been with the, um, uh, as a science and technology counselor with the Swiss Embassy in uh, Washington, D.C. Um, he also is the representative for Swiss Next, which he'll tell us about, which is uh, um, uh, tentacles of, of uh, Switzerland throughout the world. They have offices in many uh, major cities throughout the world. Uh, and. He's also been engaged in a number of activities before coming here, uh, before this posting. He was with the Department of Economic Affairs in Bern, and he headed international cooperation uh, on the Section for Innovation and Market-Oriented Research, uh, focusing on uh, uh, China and uh, Southeast Asia. And he's also been, interestingly, uh, delegate on a number of OECD committees, including the OECD Innovation Strategy. So it is with great pleasure that uh, we welcome uh, Christoph Ebel uh, to the podium. Right, good morning everyone. John, thank you so much for this really nice introduction and um, also at this point, uh, I can put my coffee anywhere here. This is dangerous. Okay, um, uh, it's, it's wonderful to be here in, in Calgary. Um, I came in yesterday, a wonderful day. Uh, so uh, I'm kind of hoping I have some time tomorrow to explore a little bit. Um, it, is, it is great to be here. By the way, I can also, uh, I could probably actually take that question um, the gentleman had before. Uh, after after my talk, if you if you want, um, if you still want if you still want to ask the question, then so um, my uh, my talk here um, a little bit in keeping with the culinary t uh, theme of the conference, um, I call it the Swiss secret sauce here. Um, it's it maybe well, anyways, um, we'll, we'll we'll see what happens. Um, I'm not sure if we uh, if we actually arrive at a, at an actual recipe for innovation, but I think what um, uh, what I want to do is. Um, Take some of the uh, the cues I got from from Didier's talk, and uh, we we did in fact not communicate on this. But uh, I think um, what I can do is I can sort of contextualize a little bit what uh, what Didier said. Um, he gave a very um, nice uh, presentation of sort of the achievements of uh, of the Swiss innovation system, and also on a, on a more micro scale in, in in his hospital how they actually do it, which is which is very valuable. But I think I can maybe put that in a more systemic um, context and look at a few things that may contribute to the, to the Swiss um, success there. So this is, um, I'm, I'm actually trying to find a, a slide that Didier hasn't already shown, but this is one of them he has already shown. But that's sort of the starting point, I think, for our discussion. It's, that's where, uh, where basically John um, is coming from when he asks uh, why, you know, what is, what is the, um, uh, What's the ingredient sort of in, in the Swiss innovation system that makes that sort of thing possible uh, on a sort of on a consistent basis? So this is not something we, we just kind of achieved over you know like after years and years of of struggle and then you know you get there. It's really something that has been has been out there uh, for a while. The problem with these situations, just as a um, in, in brackets here, perhaps, is that of course if you find yourself in this position, this is the moment you should be starting to be really afraid. Because um, the question is always that how do you how do you stay up there and um, how do you how do you ensure that you're not getting lazy? So I think that's also something to think about when you're when you're up there. So let me um, that's another one you've already pretty much seen um, the Swiss biotech landscape. This is just as a 
um, also as uh, you know, tacking on to what, what Didier said, I think an important one, and I'm, I'm going to come back to this, but I think one of the things that are important um, on this slide here are um, to see the, the density of the, uh, of the Swiss innovation landscape. Again, this is a, an, a, an example from the biotech uh, industry. Of course, this is sectorial. There are definitely different sectors. There's the, obviously the medtech sector, but uh, there's a range of other sectors uh, as well that are partly related to that. Um, I just want to say it's important to look at, um, at the density here. So, um, but in order to, uh, to sort of uh, theorize or conceptualize that a little bit better, um, I, want to, uh, I want to use um, a, an approach that is called commonly in, in innovation uh, theory, the SI approach, the systems of innovation approach. And um, a couple of factors are, uh, are listed here, or a couple of um, uh, points, what, what this actually means are listed here. So um, if you look at an innovation system, really, what you're doing is you look at components and interactions in an inter innovation system. Um, the, main co the main components in that system, uh, in, in such a system, are organizations and institutions. Um, by the way, in this case, organizations are, could, be, uh, could be firms, could be universities, um, any entity that is an actor in that system. Institutions refers to sort of the framework conditions, not necessarily an institution as in a university, but sort of um, the IPR regime, uh, regula regulatory environments and such. Um, and then I think uh, a very key um, thing we have to look at is the interactions the activities between the components, and they are absolutely crucial. And I think this is also a little bit where we want to we want to go and have a, have a closer look at. Um, I think the last point is really important in that in that context as well. Um, the, a satisfactory explanation why an innovation system is good or bad or, or, or medium um, is not going to be a linear one. It is all, this is always going to be a multi-causal uh, thing. Um, and just again, to sort of um, maybe. Uh, expand a little bit on, on what Didier said. Um, the, uh, the model that um, innovation is sort of a, a pipeline model that you know you put you put something on and in there on this side. Um, let's say lots of money for R and D, and then on the other side, uh, you know great companies and jobs kind of pop out magically. That sort of very linear system is probably flawed. So it's not just and you know, just going back to this point, it's not just this one input, it's really a, um, and this is what I'm trying to get at a little bit, um, it is going to be more of a ecosystem approach. Um, let's have a look at a couple of those activities here in point three. Um, I think the institutions are relatively clear. I think we have the same institutions in most advanced economies. Uh, there's the there's private industry, there's the government sector, there is um, there's R and D in many forms, and in many uh, in many organizations. So um, let's have a look at what those interactions are, and which ones are in fact relevant activities. So we talked about um, R and D provisions, so the, the the availability of research. And I'm just, what I'm gonna, I want to do here is a little bit give you a flavor for each of those points. Um, what is, uh, what's going on in Switzerland. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna use that approach a little bit to structure um, those components um, so that maybe you can see what the, um, how, they, how they look in Switzerland. So if you look at R&D provision here, and I think I don't have to add very much to what DDS said here, um, I think the, the, the basic um, idea we can, we can uh, take for granted is that uh, R&D is, is really good in Switzerland. So um, it's financed uh, about one quarter is public financed, meaning about six billion, um, six billion U.S. dollars or Swiss francs, one to one right now, uh, Canadian probably too. Is, um, so about six billion uh, public finance, and the rest, the other three quarters are, um, are uh, in fact private R&D, meaning um, big, big and small companies doing R&D. Um, one interesting fact here, and I think this is, uh, this is going to lead up to another point um, I'm going to make later, is that um, for every 100% of R&D expenditure in Switzerland, uh, combined pri public and private, there's another 104% uh, being performed abroad by Swiss actors. So I think that's an, that's an important sort of point I, I want you to keep in the back of your minds. Um, 
for, for Japan, just by comparison, um, the comparison is 100% uh, in Japan, 5% abroad. So just as, I mean, these are extremes on, 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 the, on the end of scale, but I mean, these are notable differences. I think this is a notable, important difference uh, in the Swiss system here. Now, competence building, next point. Uh, we talk about competence. Uh, we, we, a lot of times we look at, um, we look at people in, in higher education. We look at P, uh, PhDs, postdocs, um, people who are, are going to be actually at the bench doing the research, uh, coming up with, this, with the great idea, right? Um, that is absolutely true. This is one factor. But I think, again, here in the Swiss system, what we have, in addition to that, or there's at least a, a recognition of that, is that uh, to be a successful innovation nation, you will have to also look at uh, technical education, vocational training, uh, those things. Absolutely crucial to have the skilled labor um, available and ready to help you. Um, a lot of innovation in medical technology uh, is in fact not necessarily produced by the, um, by the PhD uh, finding some new technology. It's really done by technicians um, who try to find a new solution for a problem that's just thrown at them. So the better skilled um, and the better the interaction between your uh, workforce and your highly skilled PhDs, the better uh, the innovation environment in your company. And the availability of, um, of skilled uh, labor is not just something that helps you innovate um, in the lab, but it will also make production possible. It will make manufacturing locally uh, a possibility, uh, and it will make it uh, cost effective. Why is it important to have manufacturing on, uh, locally? It is important because um, in innovation, if you, if you completely separate manufacturing from, um, from the, from the R&D, you will lose innovation. You will not, you'll not be able to, to innovate. So these things have to be together, and so this is the, uh, why um, the, um, uh, the vocational training part is as important, probably, as the, uh, the higher education and the excellence-based uh, research at universities. Um, if we look at markets and demand side, obviously this is a big factor as well. If you don't have a market and if you, have a, if you don't have a demand side feedback for your products, your innovation will be less good. So in the Swiss uh, environment, and um, speci specifically if you look at medical and, and uh, biomedical innovation, of course, the density also of the healthcare system is an important, uh, important part. So if there's a, if there's a vibrant um, researching uh, a hospital and a care environment that actually uses those innovations, you will get feedback and you will get immediate feedback on your, on your, on your innovation. Um, I, ha I was at a, at a breakfast last week at, uh, within the, um, the, uh, the Bio Industry Association Conference at Bio in Boston um, that was sponsored by the European Institute and the, um, uh, the boss of um, Sanofi was there, uh, Christopher, whatever his last name is, so beautiful first name though. Um, uh, he said, innovation is going to happen within the hospital environment. In our business, we will have to take innovation to the bad side, really. So he said, never again will Sanofi build a Taj Mahal of research in one of those gleaming glass towers where you know, research is being done. They want to go out and they want to you know, be part of the environment. I think Switzerland provides that uh, very high density um, of hospitals, um, very high standard of care. Um, very expensive system as well, of course. Um, you have to look at that too. Uh, it is the second most, um, second most expensive healthcare system in the world after the United States. There's a big gap, but still it's number two. Um, but this is a component here in, in that specific sect sector that's definitely important. 